not the answer, it's not, it's not right, it's not the solution, it's not the long-term solution, it's not the short-term solution. And um, to, uh, create, um, to create a place where um, equal and um, essentially the three generations thereafter, my grandparents, my aunts, uncles and cousins, they were born and raised in Israel, uh, the state of Israel, only have Israeli citizenship and um, that is all they know. That includes my mum yeah. and um, my uh, brother was born there as well but um, uh, it's my dad married my mum, my brother was born there then they moved here and I was born there and so we are the only from no of course um, yes thank you and um, so for uh, a lot of the time uh, we were um, uh, the only we were for most of the you know what, that might drop of... I'll show you how to do it I, I could see you struggling you know yeah. what you do just pull this hair that thank lift that you up. thank you so much um, so there we go okay so for um, a lot of um, uh, uh, time, m most of that, that, we were the only ones in the family with dual citizenship on my mum's side. Very recently, my um, one of my cousins got married and now he also has um, Danish citizenship as well, I believe. But um, for three generations, only Israeli citizenship. And I grew up in this system as a Jewish British Israeli, where I um, was raised within both the Jewish diaspora narrative and the Israeli narrative. I, we traveled to Israel since before I could talk, um, and we have history of going there a lot. Um, and it, uh, so growing up, I was raised with this extremely specific narrative, a very pinhole view of what has happened and what is going on and how essentially due to fear we need this place we have to have this place we have nowhere else to go and it's them or us it's very much seen as a black and white situation and um as i was growing up i begun to start to question these um what was what was what was seen as facts for me growing up and it has slowly over time it's a very slow process um, learning to um, unlearn a lot of things that have been taught to me, but also to um, come to terms with the fact that this is part of my history, but this isn't something I agree with, this isn't something I side with. Um, and I have come to the point, and I'm fortunate enough that even though my parents may disagree with me in a lot of things, we, have, we're, we do have these conversations at home, and I'm allowed to have these conversations and to have these opinions expressed here, where um, I would very strongly now call myself an anti-Zionist, and I do not believe that the state of Israel is the answer, nor is it something that should be maintained from its inception. It put Jews first above all else, thereby displacing Palestinians, and there is the more I looked into it, the more I could see that there was um, a systematic oppression, uh, systematic racism as well, in um, and the treatment and also absolute censorship within Israel that they try to also extend within the diaspora. And um, how do you think they do it in the diaspora? Okay, so the, this is very much through. Uh, I don't want to take you off your train of thought. So no, I'll that's that absolutely mind, yeah. fine, and I really appreciate that. So. Um, how it sort of occurs in the diaspora and diaspora internationally all over the world anywhere where there is um, a cluster of Jewish population in the area um, so typically you have uh, Jewish school systems so for example I went to Jewish schools uh, I went to my local Jewish school I went from um, pre-primary to primary to secondary and throughout there there is um, a, there is a really strong, um, of course you have the pride of being Jewish and you have that um, uh, to, to learn about the history and the, the, the story of the Torah and how that feeds into how we practice it today. But there is also an overlapping of Israeli nationalism. And this is over three generations worth of practicing, of, of fine tuning this art where it's to grow up in the system is to also praise Israel for what it is as to being a safe place and for where we truly belong and maybe one day we'll, we'll go and return there. And it's uh, essentially the narrative has gotten to the point where to be Jewish is to support Israel. And that is the blanket statement that a lot of people outside of the diaspora and outside of the Israeli circles 
assume and see. And it is very much the, at least until recent history, history, the majority of the case. However, what we're starting to see, especially with um, current gen, like Gen Z and Gen Alpha, and um, it's starting to grow. There is discourse within the communities as people are really starting to question the narratives that have been set upon us since birth. And um, we're seeing very much now that um, a lot of what we've been told as fact, as the being raised in fear and fear being used to justify what is currently the state of Israel and the con continued existence of the state of Israel. Um, it's based on misconstruction, it's based on um, misleading, avoidance. Um, uh, there's uh, and there's a very much a um, sort of protective sphere of um, because we believe that we're constantly, currently, presently being persecuted um, from a historic context as well. Uh, that sort of feeds into it always being scared now to the point where, I mean, just as an example, I had a, an argument that literally got to the point of shouting over just wearing this in public just wearing the uh, Star of David outside because my parents were convinced that at one point or another, me wearing this, I would get uh, attacked in some form. That is a great example of how the fear has been Im um, imbued in these circles. Um, Have you had any comments about wearing that speaker's corner today? No. <laughs> okay. And I'll make it very clear. I also um, I went to uh, my first in-person uh, pro-Palestinian uh, rally as well. I was in the Jewish block. Um, say hi to us if you're there. And um, we, it was one of the most genuinely, and I say this with from the bottom of my heart, one of the most loving, um, warm and embracing sort of moments of everyone just knowing that we're united in this cause against what Israel is doing and what the state is doing and what it historically has done and continues to do and attempts to want to do in the future. And we need to work into preventing that now, very much so. Um, and I've, I've, as I've, I would say actually, this was very much the starting point for me to really start to question things because um, up until that point, for a lot of Jews, to be fair, we are told, we're not even told really about the Nakba. We're not even told about the Green Line. That's not something that is present in the conversation. So we are naive. So we the people that aware. don't know what the Green Line is. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. So the Green Line is um, what is currently uh, establishes um, the, um, the current state of Israel with where the Gaza Strip is, uh, the West Bank is, Golan Heights and, um, uh, well, East Jerusalem got annexed in 67, but um, this is basically the border of where the state of Israel ends and the stateless begins, let's say. And you have Israelis that have no idea what the Green Line is and they're in settlements and they don't even realize they're in it. It's a very great example of how much the censorship works there. And that's due to a variety of reasons as well, because um, so for a lot of articles out there that are um, talking about what is happening to civilians in Palestine, uh, in the Gaza Strip or the abuse that goes on in the West Bank or the um, also the abuse that goes on in East Jerusalem, annex, but it's still very much a secondary citizenship kind of attitude. A lot of these articles are written in English, and English is absolutely a language that is present in Israel. It's typically a second, a secondary language to people, but people aren't extremely fluent in it. And so not having articles in Hebrew for them to read, to absorb, especially at a young age, um, makes it, it separates them from access to the narrative of what the government is, give, is imbuing upon them. Right. Um, on top of that, there is, and you see this in the diaspora as well, there is a really strong sense of because there's, the fear is so strong and the it's them or us mentality is yeah. so present, you create a knee-jerk reaction of when you are hit with facts, just immediately deny it because your trust to the state is so true and is so present. Um, and to question it, you, cre you face intense social stigma and um, you face it incredibly so in Israel, 
uh, but you also face it in the diaspora as well. And um, so, like, if you went to um, a if you went to a local synagogue, because remember, to be pro uh, pro Palestine within the Jewish community is not stuck with this. It's not uh, directly related to a specific level of religiousness. So you know you have different shuls for different levels of religiousness, which represents different levels of the community, for different parts of the community. There are, it is an absolute mess of opinions in every single level, from Hasidic to liberal. You have people that are um, having tensions in their local communities of where they stand and where their opinions are. And um, you know, it's and we and another thing we've got to be aware of as well is um, freedom of expression and freedom of press in Israel. Mm -hmm. So on top of social attitudes, if people are to get together to have a protest, I remember um, post October seventh, and forgive me for not being able to talk about the facts specifically; they they come off my mind. But um, one of the very first anti-war protests in Israel that occurred required a Supreme Court approval where it was the civilians trying to organize this protest against the police, mm -hmm. which is effectively the state. It's against the state as well. So, and what you can see multiple times is these blockades of skewing of the law to prevent people that want to get their voices heard against the, against the social sort of default yeah. to try and get their voices heard and then it's stopped by the police. Um, you, there, were, there were some really fascinating videos actually of um, uh, specifically um, on Instagram it's um, all that's left and the radical block Tel Aviv. Those are two great examples of seeing protests that are occurring that are anti anti Netanyahu, anti-war, anti and um, pro-Palestine in its nature where um, in the middle of their process do you have um, citizens, other civilians, um, Israeli, who are just in absolute denial of the level of atrocities that are occurring to civilians there because, frankly speaking, it's not shown on the news and I can vouch for that. Um, at home, we have the N12 News. That yeah. The N12 News, it's one of the uh -huh. Israeli channels. It's, it's one the of, main one, isn't it? Yeah, it's one of the popular ones. And. Um, Post October 7th, it was a great example of seeing how the narrative was only focused on the hostages, which is, I understand covering of the hostages. We are concerned about getting returning civilians to their families and making sure everyone is safe and no one gets harmed. Yeah. But the narrative was only focused on the hostages. There was no mention of civilian distraught within the Gaza Strip of what was actually happening to the people there. It is generalized and the narrative is created that everyone there is part of Hamas one way or another and it's this this dehumanization and vilifying that occurs whether they're aware of it or not and a lot of the times they're not even really aware of it because they don't hear the other narrative they don't necessarily have access the ac the uh, the resources are there but they're first of all they're in English like I said before yeah. so it makes it more difficult to reach out and you need to actively pursue it there is censorship that very much goes on and the um, shutting down of Al Jazeera is a prime example yes. of how we how Israel lost one of the really great journalistic news sources to have direct access. We have um, one of the Haaretz journalists um, said on record how it was a disaster mm -hmm. that Al Jazeera got shut down in Israel because for them, Israeli journalists, it was their source of information to what was really going on inside the Gaza Strip that wasn't filtered through what the IDF was telling them. Uh -huh. And it's it's really a manufactured result of from the inception of the country um, and quickly establishing laws that put um, 48 ers those that is um, uh, Palestinians with Israeli citizenship within the um, undisputed state of Israel um, that um, have um, them be at a disadvantage to Jewish Israelis um, uh, and uh, the effects that it's happening uh, again: Golan Heights, Gaza Bank, uh, Gaza Strip, West Bank, and East uh, Jerusalem as well. Um, it's just consistent mistreatment and su and um, supremacy of Judaism that is there as a Jewish state. And I, 
and that sort of led me to the decision that a lot of Jews are starting to see themselves, including in Israel as well, that just the current treatment is not the answer. It's not it's not right. It's not the solution. It's not the long term solution. It's not the short term solution. And um, to uh, create um, to create a place where um, equal equal rights and um, just equal humanity. You know, this is very basic yes. stuff that if you speak to certain Israelis about it or certain Jews about this as well, and even those who aren't uh, but, uh, are in the Zionist headspace, speak to any Zionist about this. When you give them certain facts like how Israel has illegally used white phosphorus, which is um, a banned uh, substance um, within the Gaza Strip during the October 7th and historically, and it's a war crime that they've done so, and that the Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International have shown this to be the case, their knee-jerk reaction is to deny. We so just for the crowd, the white phosphorus is something that when you drop it, mm. it literally melts the skin. And burns to the bone, burns past the bone. And what's also tragic about it as well is that even if you survive these excruciating burns, you are you get cancer in the long term. So you're plagued with the effects of white phosphorus as soon as it comes in contact. Wow. And specifically, the, uh, it's important to note that they were using it in highly densely populated civilian areas, mm -hmm. which is another war crime on top of the war crime of using it in the first right. place. Um, and when you so the denial of um, that uh, of these facts is also stemmed from uh, so I said um, I've said this many times um, about uh, the language barrier but also um, in the diaspora and in Israel you get raised to essentially and I, I remember being told this multiple times don't trust what Amnesty International says um, the UN isn't on our side um, human rights watch isn't on our side and you know as someone who is anti-Zionist and has like sort of deprogrammed myself from a lot of this this sounds insane mm -hmm. it's absolutely ridiculous these are humanitarian non-profit organizations and we um, and you really just you have so much blind faith because you've been told your entire life that you have nowhere else. Mm -hmm. You only have this land. And you don't even have access to the option, to the idea of treat of like coming to the notion of treating Palestinians uh, like equally. And it's insane. It's absolute insanity. And it, you don't realize it's insane until you've come out of it. And then you get this frustrating situation where you try and speak to people about it who are still in the depths of being the Zionistic system that they were raised in to absolutely deny what's going on. And I would, I would, I would, that's all right. I would absolutely say that um, the Zionistic system within Judaism is very much a programmed approach and the deprogramming takes a very long time. And it's really interesting actually, because when you go to the Jewish block of these pro-Palestine rallies, you have people like me who are anti-Israel, anti-Zionist. You have also people that are anti-Zionist, but they're not quite where I am on the spectrum, where like they're still in the process of deprogramming, as I would say, where they believe that uh, maybe a two-state solution is the way to go. Um, uh, it, like it's clinging on to the fact that Israel is part of their identity, and they have to let go of that. And and remember, I'm someone that has three generations. This was not an easy process to let go, to separate and to relearn a lot of um, what was taught to us and that was frankly untrue and misconstrued and racist and uh, however other many words. Um, and when it comes to people that were raised in this process, I would definitely say as well, again, we're, tangent, we're going on a tangent a bit, but I would definitely say that it's absolutely, people can unlearn and relearn um, what Zionism really is and what it truly stands for and how uh, nationalistic and racist this approach is. And um, it is absolutely possible, I'm proof of that. It takes time, it really does. And there's a lot of levels of acceptance that needs to go of coming to terms that you are on the side of history that has contributed to this, that has over multiple generations played a part in establishing and maintaining the current status quo. And um, you need to actively want to look for the truth and to be honest with yourself and to face the facts. And it's 
it's something that takes time, but it's absolutely possible. So I, I would say that even citizens of Israel currently, um, including specifically Jewish citizens, we are already seeing that a lot of them are starting to wake up. Well, a minority is starting to wake up. But forgive me for being optimistic. I am optimistic that that voice can grow and that we can start to really question the, um, the lack of freedom of speech and freedom of press that is currently happening in the state. So, absolutely. So, the, the reason why I just let you speak because... <laughs> I appreciate I, it, thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, I think... I don't think what I would have said would have been any beneficial than what you were saying, frankly. Mm -hmm. You covered everything uh, very nicely, mm -hmm. and uh, it's, a, it's a point of view and a perspective that we're in desperate and dire need of. Mm -hmm. And for us to, for me to just unnecessarily be jumping in, I think would have been an injustice oh. to what, what you were saying, because frankly, uh, it, it, that was a breath of fresh air. Um, and we'll, we'll continue kind of, mm -hmm. um, I, I'll, I'll hit you back with some questions, but mm -hmm. I think it's important for people to realize that when it comes to these discussions, speak when you need to speak mm -hmm. otherwise if someone else is speaking sense doesn't matter who it is you let them speak mm -hmm. and there were a lot of things that you mentioned i think it was very fascinating especially mm -hmm. your your view of how um this uh, the the lack of education mm -hmm. is being peripherated in, in yeah. certain kind yeah. of places and certain yeah. communities. It's, it's selected history. Yes. And it's very biased and it's done with intent. Whether the people in the system are aware of it or not, it is very much so a result of both lobbying within Israel and lobbying within the diaspora by pro Israeli movements. Mm -hmm. And um, it's how um, a lot of Jewish schools around the world follow this narrative, shuls do as well, um, Jewish newspapers um, go into it as well. And it's really important both within these circles and for people outside of these circles to be aware that there are Jews and there are uh, people with Israeli citizenship that are questioning and going actively against what this narrative is and that these voices are present and we're really trying to grow these voices and we're really trying to make it clear that we disagree with this wholeheartedly it's not the answer, it's not what we're looking for, and it's not the solution to, um, forgive me for being cheesy, but it's not the solution for peace in the Middle East. So, yeah. Are you not worried about, say, your safety or how your own community is gonna see you? Mm. What has been their reaction to you? Okay. Because a lot of people are kind of afraid of yes. going against the narrative of their own Absolutely. community. Absolutely, and uh, that is definitely one of the stigmas that for anyone, who is starting to ha ask these questions themselves in these communities, that's one of the first things you face. Because when you first start to have these opinions, it feels incredibly isolating. You feel like you're the only one yeah. and there's no one else out there. And thank Instagram because there is much proof in multiple places, including in the UK, Naamod. If you're not aware, um, if there are any diasporan British Jews listening, Naamod UK, take a look at them. They're doing phenomenal work. Um, they are an anti-apartheid um, pro-peace movement in the UK that is attempting to lobby against uh, Britain's actions towards supporting Israel and war. Fantastic. But, yeah. Big up Namud. Yes, Namud UK. They're doing phenomenal work. I okay. will preach about them till the cows come home. Um, so, uh, yes, stigma in uh, social circles. So, um, personally, I have... Um, for lack of a better term, I've come out to my family about these opinions, um, specifically to my parents and my brother and his fiance. Um, so um, they are aware and to different levels they disagree with me. Um, but I am very thankful that my uh, dad specifically has allowed me to have these conversations at home um, to express my opinion and to explore these viewpoints. Um, it helped me form the opinion that I currently have. Even if he does disagree with it, he very much respects my opinion and I'm very thankful that he let me have that space even if he doesn't agree with me. With regard to the outer Jewish sphere, uh, I would say that um, uh, I'm not currently a member of a synagogue locally or anything like that. 
Um, so, um, my... it's, it's like the point that you mentioned that mm. because you class yourself as an anti Zionist, yeah. naturally that's going to be attached with the label of anti Semitic. Yeah. Have you got those labels thrown at you? No, or? Not yet. Um, oh no, I think my, <laughs> I think my, I think my brother may have uh, chucked something. I can't there remember. It is. <laughs> I can't. I can't remember. Yeah. But what's really important, the Zionists that are saying that it's anti-Semitic, the kind of thoughts that I have, are once again fulfilling the systematic narrative of melding being Jewish with the state of Israel. Exactly. And yeah. we need to separate it. And a lot of people are really starting to do that narrative. You're seeing it in encampments in, the, in uh, America yeah. and even in England here. And you're seeing it internationally with all the movements that I talked about as well, including in Israel as well. They're trying to separate. They're trying to start the process of separating it. Um, it's a little more nuanced there, I would say. Um, but. Um, my, uh, I will say, my Israeli family isn't aware. I haven't specifically stated these opinions. Um, I would say that my, even my family in England here aren't necessarily, they, they're aware I'm not sympathetic to the Israeli cause. they not necessarily aware I'm to the point of being anti-Israel, um, uh, which is a very interesting opinion to have as someone, uh, to them, it's a very interesting opinion that I have as someone with family that is, is um, with Israeli citizenship as well. But I stand by what I believe in, and I believe in the humani humanity comes first. So, there. You're still, uh, yeah. you're still part of the Jewish faith. I am. I, I, I don't just wear this for show. Um, I do consider myself Jewish, and I consider myself. Um, this was very much this whole process of understanding. Um, my Israeli history and my um, sort of where it came from and separating it from my Judaism helped me be more proud and more loud, let's say, of being Jewish, with, just with regards to just wearing this in public. I make sure to wear this outside to continuously prove that, you know, the world's not out to get us. We're not going to get attacked. I'd like to think we're not going to get attacked on the street. <laughs> and yeah, exactly. And um, I've been proven this. Is, I've proven this to be the case for long enough now that I just this idea of it's more about the idea of fearing, the idea of being feared than actually um, than actually being hated. The idea of being hated than actually being hated. Um, so. It's just, especially with Ashkenazi Jews, there is a very strong history of um, mistreatment, displacement, um, resettlement, and pogroms and such. And um, with both, si both sides of my family being Ashkenazi Jews, there is a very strong um, narrative that got fueled into the Zionistic movement because Zionism, when it was created, was within the European area, I believe. Um, and this sort of colonialism attitude was inherited by um, sort of the British attitudes that were happening at the time and it created this like what was seen as this is the only solution to um, bulldoze whatever is already there, rewrite the narrative and history that there was no one there, it was barely present, we made the lands green or however the statement went. Yeah. And, um, it was, and to the point as well, I think this is very important to mention, it is um, the Nakba's not, only the Nakba's not covered in the diaspora, it's also not covered in Israel, but it's also um, within, uh, I think it's also like looked negatively on if Arabs are to mention, um, Arabs within these territories are to mention anything with relation to the Nakba, it could hinder them getting Israeli citizenship, even if they don't agree with the state of Israel. Israeli citizenship is needed, first of all, to vote for the lands that they're under, but also to get access to work and access to borders into these territories. So that's one of the reasons that they would be applying for citizenship and are applying for citizenship. Um, the um, Israeli um, Ministry of um, uh, immigration and such yeah. purposefully delay and prolong these um, applications um, with East Jerusalem being a really prime example only 5% please correct uh, correct me if I'm wrong I believe this is correct only 5% of um, Arabs in East Jerusalem, which has been annexed in 1967. They are under the state of Israel. They, should, they have the right to apply for Israeli citizenship. Only 5% got to have been accepted since um, the uh, inception of, um, since the annexing in 67, yeah. which is ridiculous. 
And um, when you look at even recent history from like, I want to say uh, mid 2010s to 2021, only 36 applications that over this period of time got accepted. And you have a wide variety of reasons. You need to um, not, and it's some, uh, let me just say the reasons are stupid. You've got, um, uh, if you failed your is it Hebrew proficiency test, that's going to be a negative. If you um, have posted in social media the Palestinian flag or said anything with regards to the Nakba or any form of sympathy to the situation, um, you'll wow. get dismissed. Absolutely. This feeds into the censorship situation. Yeah. Um, you also have this, uh, and it gets really horrendous because you get these really vague statements of um, unsupportive to the um, state's cause or something uh -huh. like that. Uh, it's That's not the exact wording, but there is incredibly vague wording, which then gets used right. to then have reject or delay applications with almost no real reason, with no real reason a lot of the time as well. And it's, um, and it's just really ho horrific to see. This is a great example of how the Zionist state is supposedly these people should have right to this citizenship and be treated as equals, and they're not. And even 48ers aren't being treated as equal as well with um, 10 key discriminatory laws that are present from um, an Arab as a, who is a member of Knesset um, can be discharged from being a member of the parliament, the Knesset, if the, if the um, majority uh, think that their, their opinions are too extreme or too violent. Funny how that law wouldn't extend now to the current situation in the Knesset where you've got some real crazy people saying some really horrific stuff, but it spe specifies Arabs which, again, that is just racist and just an absolute horrendous standpoint. Um, you also have um, laws that create a situation where when new towns are being built within the state of Israel, um, first of all, um, the funding towards the development of these towns, um, the government, there is a law that says the government can decide where funding is allocated. So if a town is going to be majority Arab, um, they are likely to, it gets construed so that they receive less funding and then Jewish um, exclusive states um, get construed to get more funding. And then um, with when these um, settlements are, um, um, when these towns, uh, settlements are in the West Bank, yes, but towns within the Israeli states for specifying, I just want to use the correct wording, sorry. That's fine. Um, so um, when these towns are built and um, the local community decides who comes in, there is another law that is pairs very nicely with the previous law I just mentioned. I say this uh, like it, it's, it's horrendous, but like, you know, um, it, it pairs with it of um, you can decide who comes into, who is access and can come live in this town based on, um, again, a very vague and broad statement is said. It's like, um, uh, that is like, meets your standards or something like that. And that essentially gets practiced in the way that um, Jewish Israelis are allowed and then um, Arabs, are, Arab Israelis, um, Ar um, Palestinians with Israeli citizenship are rejected. These 48ers get rejected. And so um, you have, uh, I'm specifically talking about the state of Israel. Um, these are 48ers experience, what, what 48ers can experience within the state of Israel. And so what, in the mm -hmm. I would I wouldn't mind moving. Yeah, that's, that's all right. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you so much. I'm talking today about um, what's going on in Israel Palestine. Yeah, as, uh, yes, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Uh, you know what? It's, uh, it's fine. No, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. No, over there, that's our cycle lane. No? No worries. I'll uh, let it down. There you go. Oh, She's bringing sorry. your cameras. Okay, thank you. I was backing up while you got the song. Yeah, I was, I was starting to feel it. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. And plus, be careful. You know when you're pointing it to the door, you're going to see a lot of fitna there, and then blurring and all that becomes a nightmare. Mm. So be cautious about that. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, where were we? You were talking about the 48ers. Yes. Yeah. So, um, because of those two laws, just as an example of uh, settlements, um, um, uh, living spaces, and um, you, uh, reality is created in the long term where you get um, Jewish towns that have a, a very um, stable and sustainable amount of funding um, are um, very much like uh, well established and well funded and m access to greater resources the kids in these areas have access to greater resources mm. and then um, in these um, Arab towns they had less funding from the um, establishment so resources of what is available within the community are much more strained and limited which then affects the um, access to opportunities and work and uh, such in the area and that means that these children grow up um, with a much more difficult um, access to these opportunities and such. So it really is a great example of how it's systemic in nature within the state of Israel itself. And um, yeah, so that's uh, that's just a great example. And there, there are other laws as well um, that set examples um, from uh, uh, the lack of a right to return to um, um, uh, service in the army to um, uh, just um, whether you can have dual citizenship or not there is a real double standard of um, uh, Jews being allowed dual citizenship me being a great example and um, then uh, the um, but then p uh, people in East Jerusalem for example if they have Jordanian citizenship or people in the West Bank have Jordanian citizenship they cannot apply for Israeli citizenship without get removing their citizenship from Jordan. And that is an incredibly difficult thing to do, to put yourself in for the queue of maybe getting it so that maybe you could get some more work opportunities mm -hmm. and uh, get access to, um, you know, just more, just more opportunities because Yes, like they don't agree. A, a lot of a lot of people in these areas don't agree with Israel, but this, and unfortunately for them, this is the, the this Israeli state is the place where they have access to work, access to a salary, and in, that's even the same in the West Bank, which is such a can of worms in, with regards to the border detailing about how yes we have hundreds of um, border controls in the West Bank but in the Gaza Strip you've got people queuing up from like 4 a.m. just to try and get to work at 8 or 9 yeah. and then they have to get back within a certain point uh, within a certain time to the border and be registered that they have returned or they will risk losing their right to enter into work. Last question. Sorry. Sorry to Do you support a, a two-state solution? One -state uh, so solution? I Okay, I'm person my personal opinion is that I believe considering what Israel as a Jewish state has been founded on and from how it's from the get-go oppressed and placed um, its Jewish citizens first, I completely disagree with that approach. It's not an equal approach and never will be. And the result of the current government is kind of a, uh, to not really a surprise when you see how it was founded. And so I personally believe that a, um, okay, I, I need to get the order right, um, a uh, one state that is secular and democratic, I think is personally, I think is the best approach. And specifically, Palestinians must get a right of return, get rid of that 1950s law. Um, uh, but, um, and w this may be great territory, but this is my opinion that, um, People such as my family who only have Israeli citizenship, it's the only land they know, it's the only land they've ever been on, I think they should have a right to remain in this Palestine, Palestine state as well. Um, what if they were living in the house of somebody who was kicked out? Uh, then I definitely think that we need to, when it comes to those kinds of situations, I think we need to hold everyone that um, has uh, practiced in these misdeeds accountable they need to be taken to court they need to be tried i think perhaps if there are people there that have dual citizenship and perhaps in those cases maybe they can get a visa and if they want to maybe apply for citizenship but they won't get citizenship by default palestinians i think should have the right to apply for citizenship by default because they were displaced by this state 
and that's broadly speaking where I where my opinions lie with that. I'm not, from what I understand, most most Palestinians mm -hmm. and most Israel, Jewish Israelis in opinion polls, they don't they don't support a two-state solution. They yes. reject it. Yes. By quite a good majority. Yes. And not only that, I think I would love to see one single democratic state mm -hmm. as well, but do you not think that might create some sort of gigantic civil war? Because a lot of Palestinians and Israelis wouldn't support that. They'd be no, very, of course. They'd be so, willing to go into violence and yeah, yeah, so, um, like a whole, Okay, yeah, let's go let's go I, down I, this ideally, route. Ideally I don't want to see like an ethno state, like a mm. Jewish ethno state or an Islamic state. But it might be the most Mm. The whole international community supports a two-state solution. Maybe the most realistic well, way for now. No, yeah. but I would say I a two-state so. solution is people that have not lived in the country, as, your, as the poll you stated suggests. It's from people that aren't experiencing what's going on. I would argue. The poll was done of Israelis living in Israel and mm. Palestinians. Yes, yes, yes. So, but um, yeah, they, and they they don't they disagree with the two-state, right? Right. Okay. Yes. So what I'm saying is the narrative outside of this this land that um, the two state is the only solution that's a misconstruction i would argue that what can be seen in the west bank where you've got areas a b and c um idf militant force overseeing justice and civility in the area um, I would argue that this is kind of a proteo example of what um, a two-state solution would be, and my goodness, does it fail. Because um, not only is there no um, true um, independent government there, Israel would never relinquish that control because they fear the consequences of their actions. De demographically, if they had a one single state, the mm -hmm. majority uh, Palestinian Arabs, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the, there's a sort of well, many, okay. many on the Zionists, right? They're quite concerned. Yeah, about the and and that is a perfect example of, like I said before, of how this feeds into the fear of it's them or us. We must fight for what we have, and it and, and for a lot, uh, so a lot of people there as well. It's like I'm I'm. I'm okay to not think about it because I'm in the fortunate position of being on the side of the oppressor, not the oppressed. Um, but uh, it's one of the things that really needs to be challenged. First of all, that narrative that um, Israelis are raised in needs to be challenged and the re-education and a real apparent of facts needs to be stated. And number two, uh, and this might suck them realizing this and getting to the point where you've got to learn to trust. And like, if there is no trust that this other side will treat you humanely, how on earth do you think you're going to even get a two-state solution? Mm. You know? Yeah. Because right now, the Likud party, they, they don't want it either. Arabs are not interested in a yeah, neither is the Likud party. They, they, no. they, they, uh, they don't want it either. Uh, yeah. They, they would, they would have been willing. Uh, by all means. Uh, uh, mm. Ariel Sharon pulled out of Gaza. Oh, okay. I, I, I always get confused when there's multiple can I voices. Can support boycott, divestment, sanctions movement? Yes. Can I ask, because uh, I'm much more sympathetic to your viewpoint, but not mm -hmm. on this. Mm -hmm. Do you not think it's a bit hypocritical? Because, for example, the United Kingdom mm -hmm. went into Iraq, mm -hmm. according to a Lancet, very prestigious medical journal, mm -hmm. about a million Iraqis dead because mm -hmm. of that war. Mm -hmm. right? That's not just a random figure, that's like yeah. very respected. That, so Britain has done far more damage than Israel did in the last... To compare is not to justify. I would say to compare is not to justify. Why would, why would say... boycotting the United Kingdom and the United... Never the, sorry, mm -hmm. boycotting Israel. Mm -hmm. but there's never, I never hear talk about boycotting Egypt, mm -hmm. United Kingdom, mm -hmm. Britain, okay, well, uh, United States. They've done a lot of... Okay, so I will, I will argue that uh, currently... Yes. Okay, but I would, uh, and that's fair enough as well. And these are perfect points of boycotting that oh, yes. I'm but, certain. But just as a response to that, people have been boycotting China. They have mm -hmm. been uh, boycotting Denmark. Mm -hmm. They have been boycotting America. Boycotting is it's yes. a movement. I'd like to, yeah. and I'd also sure. like to add as well that um, first of all, for me, contextually, as someone who is Jewish, British, uh, and Israeli with the passports. This is a very, this is a personal matter to me that I want to affect and contribute to affecting to. But in the grander scheme of things, currently, right now, presently, a genocide is going on and the collective unification of those that are pro-Palestinian in boycotting, as a singular person, that action may not be major, but as a collective, it has a significant economic effect, especially with Israel being a startup nation. Like, they thrive economically in creating startups, especially in the tech industry. So, 
boycotting Excuse all. Me. Come no, 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 that's all right. So, boycotting all of these systems, boy, boycotting um, the trade and the resources that come in and out, and the sources of um, uh, techno and the companies that are based there as well sets a very clear message and a very clear pressure to the, our governmental officials here to start to, to do the right thing but humanitarily. Because there is no genocide, so you've actually achieved it. Okay, uh, uh, we'll, let's just yeah, finish yeah, our yeah, thing. Yeah. I mean, that is just... Uh, sorry, that's a can of worms. <coughs> uh, We're not interested in people that can't accept well, genocide for genocide. genocide. You can have that conversation really later. You can have that conversation later. So we're just going to... We'll just, yeah, we'll, just, um, we'll just round off our conversation, which mm -hmm. went over for about an hour. Mm -hmm. And there was, I mean, you gave your time and you made some fantastic points mm -hmm. that I think are very helpful for the discussion. Mm -hmm. Points like that aren't, and you can have that discussion later. You can have that discussion later on. You can have that discussion later on. I would say this is a very well, prime example by, of a And what you're doing opinion, is, you know what you're doing? Which is very we, much I mean, staunch Tony, you've and come. set. And there is a knee-jerk reaction. There is a protective, ever, there is a protective of nature and it's very much a result of three generations of people being raised in this narrative which has gotten to being it's them or us and this is a very good example of that I would say. Yeah, <laughs> you know what, that's a very good point. That's actually, um, that's illustrated your point incredibly well mm -hmm. and because of the, uh, mashallah, how the, the depth Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm sure a lot of people watching mm. probably didn't know this. Mm. And it is a message of hope. Mm -hmm. and we don't want to contaminate it with no. these sorts of conversations oh. that happen here, you know, every other week. Mm -hmm. um, so um, thank you for it your time. It was a pleasure to have this conversation. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. And uh, thank you. yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you.